Good morning again. All right. It is truly a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord. After a two-week interlude, we're now once again going to return to the letter of 1 John. We're in part 14 today, and if you had to miss any of the sermons, you can always go back to our YouTube page, uh, Franklinville Wesleyan Church, and get called up. Or if you just want to go back and review and watch a sermon again, uh, you can do that as well. Open your Bibles and turn then to 1 John. We're going to be looking at chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We're nearing the end of our study in 1 John. And it's my sincere prayer that this study has, been, has blessed you and that it's encouraged you and maybe even challenged you in some areas. I know it's challenged me in studying and, and reading through God's Word and here, John, the beloved disciple, gives us his reason for writing this whole letter. In this next section we're about to read today, he gives us his reason, the purpose. He says in verse 12, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So his purpose, ultimately, yes, was to combat the false teaching and doctrine that was being spread throughout that that culture in that day about Jesus, but more so he wanted to give us a confidence and to give us an encouragement to persevere amongst much heresy and, and much persecution that was going on. And I believe that this letter is just as relevant today as it was roughly 1,924 years ago when John wrote this. That's roughly the time when he wrote it. With the horrors that unfolded last week in Sutherland Springs, Texas, and and again, continue to unfold around the world. We need this book. We need this Bible more than ever. It's our sword. And in this book, we find answers to the chaos surrounding us in life. In this book, we find all the answers, all the reasons why things are like they are today. In this book, though, we also find hope. We have a hope that no matter the tragedy that occurs on, and again, on any scale, it doesn't have to be a mass shooting. It could be a tragedy right there in our life, the loss of a loved one, a sickness, the loss of a job. It could be anything. We find hope. We find hope for a better day. And that hope that one day all things will be made right. And praise God that this life is not as good as it gets. It's going to get better. We have that hope. In this book, we also find the one thing that separates Christianity from all other religions in the world. And that's that. We find the, the way, we find the truth, and we find the life. And those three things are wrapped up in that one name, the name of Jesus. And in this book, we also find a peace. A peace that's beyond all human comprehension. A peace within our souls and a peace with Almighty God, most importantly. So stand now as you're able to honor the reading of God's holy word. We're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 5, starting at verse 6. Verses 6 to verse 13. 1 John 5, 6 to 13. This is the certainty of God's witness. John says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Now if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son, God, does not have life. And these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the assurance that we find in your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you have given us your word so that we may know your will, your perfect will for our lives. And that we may, as we look out upon the landscape of the world today, and we see things that are going on that we just, we can't wrap our minds around, that we know 
Lord God, that you are sovereign, that you are in control. And we know that when we look a few books over and we get to the last book, Revelation, that we know that we are victorious. We are victorious in you. And so, Father, we thank you for that today. And as verse 13 says, Lord, today as we look through your word, help us to know, to know that we know that we have eternal life today, that there is no shred of doubt in our hearts today. Speak to us today through your word, Lord. And help us that we may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God, that you, in your spirit that lives within us, Lord, help us to persevere in this dark world. And we give you the praise, we give you the glory, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So friends, in writing this letter, John has lays out three tests for believers to see if their faith is genuine. Again, that's one of his main purposes for writing this. Test number one is a proper doctrine of who Jesus is. In other words, you have to have the right Jesus. If you're worshiping the wrong Jesus, you don't have salvation because if you don't have the right Jesus, the Bible says, you don't have the Father also if you don't have the Son. So you have to have a proper doctrine and understanding. Number two, you have to be obedient to His commands. It's not enough just to say, I believe. But then we have to put feet to our belief. We have to do, not just be hearers of the Word. So obedience to His commands shows that our faith is genuine. And then lastly, number three, besides a proper doctrine and understanding of who Jesus is and obedience to His Word and His commands, part three is a love for the brethren. You must love. You must forgive. Love the unlovable. Forgive the unforgivable. It's not, a, it's not an option for the believer. Because if, the, if God's Holy Spirit is truly dwelling within you, and we know that it is God's will that none should perish and all should come to repentance and faith and that all humans are created in the image of God. How can we not love them? How can we not forgive them? And we understand how much God has truly forgiven us for in our life. How can we not forgive others? How can we say, God, I know you've forgiven me for this great multitude of sins in my life and yet I don't forgive this person over here. I won't and I can't. So we have to be able to love the brethren, truly love them. Bless you. And here in this section, we start by looking once again. John brings us right back again to that understanding of Jesus. And this, we're looking at the God-man, Jesus. In the first part of chapter 5, John had said, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves God loves the children of God and keeps His commands. And, and then he goes on to say that this is the victory that has overcome the world. And that's our faith, our trust, our hope. And then he asks, who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Remember the quote last week when we were talking about the persecuted church, the quote that I gave you from Richard Wormbrand that says, a man really believes not what he recites in his creed. In other words, you can know all the Bible verses in the world. You can know all the greatest hymns ever written. You can know all the creeds and all the pledges, but Richard Wormbrand says, a man really believes not what he recites in his creed, but only the things that he is willing to die for. So that begs the question then, do we really believe like that? Do we have that kind of faith? Do you really believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that every word of this Bible is true, that no matter what a college professor says, media says, entertainment says, or anybody says, I believe that every word beginning to end is true? Do you believe that today? Do you believe to the point that you would rather die than deny Him? As we watched that movie, The Insanity of God, we saw many people that were willing to do that and have done that. There was a pastor, a preacher, I, don't, I can't remember if I spoke about it last week, but it was a preacher who, whenever ISIS came into his village, he was a pastor of a church. And he was preaching the gospel of God, and they drug him out of there. And for 14 weeks, he stood in chains, and they set him in a room, and they would beat him every single day, saying, all you have to do is deny Christ and convert to Islam, and we'll let you go. Life will be easy for you. He said, I cannot do it. I cannot deny him. And finally they got, so after 14 weeks of this beating and punishment and, and torture, they finally came in there one evening with a hammer. And he looked at him while he was in chains and they smacked him in the mouth and they knocked one of his teeth out. And so as he's standing there and he's spitting blood out and pieces of his teeth, the man looks at him with that hammer and he shakes it at him. And I'm seeing this interview uh, that I watched with him. He said, the man looked at him and said, 
Are you going to deny Christ and convert to Islam? He said, no, I cannot deny him. He said, listen, you have a lot of teeth. I have a hammer and we have all night. He said, I cannot deny him. And so the man went about systematically knocking out his teeth one by one. And then finally they took him and they threw him out in the street, just tired of dealing with him. Some Christian, local Christians found him, took him to a safe place, and they bandaged up his wounds. And you know what? He's back preaching in that town. Still preaching. So do you believe to the point that you'd rather die than deny him? It'd be easy, you know, to let fear reign in our hearts. It really would. And I praise God that each of you got up today and came to this church today. Because it would be really easy to let fear reign in our hearts and say, you know what, that could have been us. That could have been us. The church, if you watch a little bit of the video they have of, of a prior sermon, they haven't shown the video, praise God, of what happened, but they have. you can go online and watch the pastor's sermons. And um, he had just preached the week before about tribulation and turmoil and things like that. But the church looks a lot like ours. Just a little bitty country church. It could have been us. It'd be easy to let fear reign in our hearts and say, that could have been us. I, I, I'm just, I'm not going to go. I don't, I don't want to do that. Little country church. People waking up ready to fellowship, putting on, their, putting on their pants, putting on their shoes, ready to come and hear the word of God being preached. And little do they know that a few minutes later they would no longer hear the word of God being preached, but they would be experiencing God firsthand, face to face, in his glorious presence. It'd be easy to be afraid and stay home for fear the same could happen to us at any moment. And we can't kid ourselves, it could. But if we truly believe that Jesus is who He says He is, and that every jot, every tittle, every single word of this book is true, then we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. For all man can do, Jesus said, is take your life. That's all He can do. All He can do is come in right now and shoot us and kill us. That's it. But even if we are murdered for our faith, praise God, our very next breath will be in the presence of our Lord and our Savior. Where no longer sickness, no longer death, no longer fear, no longer anything can touch us. We will be glorified in His presence. Nothing will be able to ever separate us from His great love. And John, in writing his letter, he wants his readers to know this and to be certain of this. Listen to verse 9. He says, and if you're looking at verse 9 in your scripture, he says, If we receive the witness of men, in other words, if we trust and accept what a man says, the witness, the testimony of God is greater. And he says, starting in verse 6, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. The water, that speak, the water here speaks of Christ's baptism and his blood speaks of his death. We're looking at purification and we're looking at sacrifice. But now when you read that you may, and you hear that, you may think, now wait a minute. Jesus being truly God and truly man, he was perfect and he didn't need to be baptized, right? Well, that's correct. He didn't. However, if you go back and again, we talked about weeks ago how important the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament is, the Torah all right, the book of the law. It was very, the Torah was very implicit that priests must first be purified by the washing of water before they're serving, before they're allowed to serve. It's an outward sign of an inward purification. We get that in Exodus chapter 30, verses 20 to 21. And so Jesus, who's preparing for ministry, he comes on the scene and to keep the law and fulfill all its righteous requirements, because it was required for someone to do that before they go into ministry, uh, he comes to the greatest of all prophets, as he says. I want you to hold your spot in 1 John and turn over to Matthew's Gospel. Let's look at Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 3 to 13. So again, Matthew, chapter 3, verses 3, verses 13 to 15. Matthew 3, I'll give you just a second to get there. So Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 to 15. It says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and are you coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And so he allowed him. So this was done, Jesus' baptism, this was done as a, as a testimony to everyone that was around. 
remember that we have the whole story. We have the Bible now. We can go back from Genesis to Revelation and we know the whole thing. But they didn't have that. What we're reading now, they were living back then, so they didn't have that. They needed to be witnesses that all the requirements were met. I mean, you can imagine that Jesus, instead of being baptized, instead of, of being washed with water, instead of doing that, he just goes out into ministry. They'd say, now, wait a minute. We didn't see you washed with water. We didn't see you purified. So he tells John, listen, I, I know, but all, all the righteous requirements, I have to fulfill the law. This is a requirement that God gave us in the Torah, in the law. So we must fulfill it. And so therefore, we must do this thing. And so John said, you're right. And he baptized him. So again, this was done as a testimony. And it goes on to say in 1 John 5, 6, and it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is truth. And this is corroborated back in Matthew 3. Again, if you're still in Matthew 3, look at verses 16 to 17. As soon as Jesus is baptized, it says, When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So here we see the witness of John the Baptist, the mightiest of all the prophets. We see the Holy Spirit coming down and the Father in heaven, all testifying of the Son. But not only that, in John's Gospel account, Jesus says in chapter 8, verses 17 to 18, He says, It is also written in your law, and again the Torah, He says, It is written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So now when we come to 1 John 5, 7, we can understand John's words where he says that there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, I want to kind of rabbit trail for just a second. He says these three are one. Here we have an example of the triune God, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Did you know there are many today, not only the cults like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and, and Muslims and them, uh, there are many actual people that preach in Christian churches that actually reject the idea of the Trinity. They reject it. Because they say, you know what, the word Trinity is not in there. Well, neither is the word computer, but we still have computers. So, that's true. Trinity, though, is not in there. You won't find it anywhere written in the Bible. However, by the evidence we have in Scripture, we can infer that there is the triune Godhead. And this is one example. It's one example. As again, is Jesus' baptism. When we see all three being present. We see the Son, the Holy Spirit comes down, and we hear the Father from heaven. So we see an example of the triune God, the Trinity. Now there's a false teaching out there, because again, remember part of what, why John is writing this is to come against the Gnostic heresies of the day that were saying that Jesus wasn't really a man. He was just a spirit. That's what they were teaching. And so John, part of John's reason for writing this is to fight against uh, improper doctrine, false heresies. And so one of the heresies, one of the false teachings today is known as modalism. Or historically it was known as Sabellianism. Modalism teaches that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit do not refer to three distinct persons in the Godhead, but to different modes of existence of a single person. In other words, just a single person Modus believed that in ages past that God manifested himself as the Father. Think about in the Old Testament. But then, during the incarnation of Christ, he manifested himself as the Son. And then later, he manifested himself as the Holy Spirit. One of the key tenets in modalism is the belief that God cannot exist in more than one mode at a time. And so here's where it gets really tricky, though. A modalist will say they do hold a certain form of Trinitarian theology in that, in other words, while it does proclaim that Jesus Christ is divine, if you ask a modalist, do you believe that Jesus is God? Yes, I do. They'll tell you that. But, however, this is of critical importance. It denies that there, again, they will proclaim the divinity of Jesus, but they deny that there are three distinct persons who make up the Godhead. And again, this is of critical importance. You have to believe that. Modalism has long been labeled as a heresy. In other words, from the beginning, when it first came out, people were saying, this is a heresy. Don't fall for that. So modalism, again, being labeled as heresy. If you believe this false doctrine, then you would fail one of John's tests. Because remember, one of John's tests is a proper doctrine, a right understanding. And therefore, you could not biblically call yourself a Christian. 
We define, as Christians, the proper understanding is this. We define the Trinity biblically this way. Number one, there is one God. Number two, the Father is God. Number three, the Son is God. Number four, the Holy Spirit is God. Number five, the Father is not the Son. Number six, the Son is not the Spirit. And number seven, the Spirit is not the Father. So, to summarize, you could say, when you're talking about the Trinity, God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is fully God, and there is only one God. God is one in essence and three persons. It's not easy to understand or grasp, and I don't know that we will on this side of the curtain. We just have to have faith and trust. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 22, uh, 21 to 22 Prophet Isaiah wrote, There is no other God before me. This is God speaking through the prophet. God says, There is no other God before me, a righteous God and a Savior. There is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. But then looking back at our scripture, John continues in verse 8. He says, And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. So the water, as we looked at, was, it was it witnesses Jesus' entry into his ministry. It was his baptism. The blood is a witness to his sacrificial death and the atonement for our sin. Both of these bear witness to him. And remember, since the beginning, the sacrifice from the beginning, beginning, the, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, since the very beginning, the sacrifice of the living animal, sheep, bulls, lambs, doves, these were all killed, and their blood was offered in substitution for our blood. Because the scripture declares in Ezekiel chapter 18, it says the soul that sins, it will die. So the fact that you, the proof that you sinned against God will be the fact that one day you will die. If you never sinned against God, you would never die. So Christ's blood was a testament to a new and greater covenant. Again, hold your place in 1 John and turn over to the book of Hebrews. It's only a couple of books back. Hebrews is right before uh, James. Chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse number 11. Verse 11. This is talking about the blood, the witness of Christ. Give you just a moment to get there. So again, just flip backwards from where you're at, past Peter and James, and then you come to Hebrews. So Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of, his, of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your consciousness, you're conscious from dead works to serve the living God. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has, commit, has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So again, the water witnessed Jesus' entry into ministry. The blood was a witness to the sacrificial death and atonement, sealing, if you will, a new and greater covenant with God and us. But John also says that the Spirit is a witness. Jesus said in John 16, 8, and when He, the Holy Spirit, has come, He will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in Me, and of righteousness because I go to My Father, and you see Me no more, but of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged, 
And when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. In all things the Father that the Father has are mine. Therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So the Holy Spirit is the greatest witness. Because at the moment of regeneration, the moment that you are metamorphosized, as we talked about in our, uh, uh, as Nancy read in our, um, our Sunday school lesson today, you're transformed. He comes to live within you, the Holy Spirit. You become a temple of the Holy God. The Holy Spirit comes in and he cleans out all the dirt and all the grime and all the muck, and he lives his life through you, empowering you to righteousness. I was speaking to a lady yesterday and she was telling me how hard it is to forgive, how hard it is to love, how hard it is to live the Christian life. And I would, I would go further than that to say that it's actually impossible to live the Christian life in our own power. We can't do it. We have to have the Holy Spirit within us, living His life through us. And the old saying goes like this, In the days of the temple, God was among His people. In Jesus, and when Jesus walked the earth, God was with us. God with us. And now in the Holy Spirit, God is in us. God is in us. So the Spirit, the water, and the blood, these three agree as one. But then when you look at our scripture for today, in verse 9, John continues, he says, If we will receive, in other words, if we accept the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he has testified of his Son. So if you look at that and you understand what John is really saying, and if he says it plainly, it would be like this. He says, if you would really, if you would believe the things that men say and testify to, even though we as men, as humans, are fallible and we're capable of making mistakes, how much more should you believe God Almighty, who, who cannot lie, <coughs> excuse me, and he never makes mistakes, he is perfect. And he himself testified to his own son. So it's not a matter of we don't have enough evidence. It's not a matter of we don't have enough witness because not only does his baptism, the water, and the blood testify to Christ, we have the Father testifying to Christ, we have the Holy Spirit testifying to Christ, we have the Word of God testifying to Christ, and Christ himself testifying. It's not enough that we don't have enough witness for that. But men will reject the truth. They'll reject it because they love the darkness more than they love the light. So he says again, if you will receive the witness of men, you must believe how much stronger is God's witness. Trust him. If you don't trust any man, trust his word because God wrote his word. And he goes on to say in verse 10, he who believes in the Son of God has that witness in himself. And he who does not believe, who does not trust God, has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. There can be no greater insult to the integrity of God than by not believing his testimony. I mean, think about it. By doing so, you're saying, you know what, I know your word says that, God. I know it does, but I just don't think you're trustworthy. I don't think I can trust you. How much of an insult is that to our God when we don't trust the things that he has written for us to know? But listen to Paul's words to the church in Corinth. He wrote a, this, his letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to the church in Corinth. He said, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. Can't do it if the Spirit's living within you. He says that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. You can't even call him Lord unless the Holy Spirit is living within you. So if you can boldly and confidently say that Jesus is your Lord and your Savior and your King, this is evidence of the indwelling Holy Spirit within you. And he says in verse 11 of, of 1 John 5, he says, This is the testimony that God has given us, and that's eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. Do you know that? If you have the Son, you have life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. He has no hope. Jesus said in John chapter 3, we always like John 3, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. But he had to go on and look at John 3, 17 to 18. Jesus said, For God, the purpose, for God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He says, He who believes in him is not condemned, 
But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And John concludes his section here in 1 John to encourage us. He encourages us. He says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So if you believe in the name of the Son of God today, if you're trusting in that, he's saying, I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. And the reason why I'm writing to you is so that you may know that you have eternal life. You may have confidence in that. You can believe that even to the point if it means your death because you won't deny Him. You can have that confidence. You can know that. No other religion on earth can do this. Only Christianity gives us that kind of confidence and assurance of our salvation and the promise of eternal life. Every other religion, in which we have very many, all these religions are based on our merit, our worth, our good deeds. We have none. Did you know we have none? Our best deeds, the Bible says, are but filthy rags in God's sight. If it's used to try and earn merit and favor with God. No other religion can give us that assurance. You talk to people of different faiths, and you say, if there's a heaven, are you good enough to go there? You know what they say? I hope so. I don't know. It's up for him to decide. That's a frightful way to go through life. <coughs> it's a frightful way. Every other religion in the world says you must do, do, and you must do. You must work, you must earn, you must strive. But Christianity is the only one that says, you know what? There's nothing you can do. And you know what the good news is? It's already done. It's finished. Work was done 2,000 years ago. Now you have to repent and believe. His first words of Christ as he, after he was baptized and led through the wilderness for 40 days, his first words of ministry, repent. Repent. Repent and believe the gospel. So you don't have to be afraid if you put your faith in the Messiah through repentance and faith. You no longer have to fear. A gunman can walk in here right now and kill every single one of us. And if you, if you have your faith and trust in Christ, know that your next waking moment, your next breath that you take, as you, as you breathe your last breath on this earth, your next breath, that <gasps> thing about coming up out of water. I heard it expressed that our entry into heaven is like whenever you're, if you've ever held your breath underwater for a long time and you see the surface and you finally you swim up, the minute you break the surface, what are you like? You go, <gasps> and you take that next breath. That's what it will be like. That's what it will be like when you stand before your Creator. How great a picture is that? Our next breath will be before Him. And John writes, that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. In other words, not only does He write to encourage us and to give us that hope and that faith, He also encourages us to persevere. He wants you to persevere in the faith because our hope and joy are not based on any kind of external circumstances. Not on our health, not on our wealth, not on anything. But it's based on the internal living Holy Spirit living within us. If you're a, a new creation, if your life is different than it used to be, if you're truly born again in the faith, then you will know. Because the I have to's that you used to feel like you had to do become the I want to's. I want to do that. I want to. I want to have faith in God. I want to pray. I want to, I want to go to church. I want to read my Bible. I can't get enough of it. If you have that burning desire within you, remember we talked about what it meant to be a disciple, a true disciple, a tell me in the Hebrew. If you have that burning desire to be with your Savior, to be like your Savior, to be in the Word of God today, you have hope. You have the Holy Spirit living within you. But again, this promise and this hope and this assurance is only for those who have repented of their sins and placed their faith in the Savior. And the lady asked me yesterday, she said, but aren't we all God's children? Aren't we all God's children? The answer in the Bible is no. You see, we are all created in the image of God. You've been created in the image of God, therefore you have worth and you are special. However, the Bible says that outside of Christ, outside of salvation, the only thing that remains for you is God's wrath. You're either a child of wrath, according to the Scripture, or you're a child of God. God has offered a free gift of grace. He holds out His hand. It's free. You don't have to earn it. You cannot earn it. But those are your only two choices. So do you have the confidence to say without a shadow of a doubt that if today was your last day, and for one day it will be each and every one of us, if you fast forward 120 years from now, none of us will still be around. I mean, I plan on living forever and so far so good, but... You know, 120 years from now, none of us will be here. We'll be but a memory. So do you have the confidence to say that without a shadow of a doubt that if today was your day that has been appointed to you, because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. God has got it written in his book. He knows the day. We don't. If today was that day, 
And today you are to die, breathe your last breath, and you stand before your God, before your Creator. Would He say, well done, you good and faithful servant? Would He say that to you? Or would He say, depart from me, I never knew you? If your answer today is, well, I don't know, but I hope so. Friends, there's nothing more important than where you will spend eternity. Nothing. Nothing is more important. John says that he wrote this letter so that you would know. He wants you to know that you have eternal life. And so because he says that, that tells us that we can know. People will tell you, well, you can't know. Yes, you can. Because my Bible says I can. My Bible says if I repent and I trust the Savior, I have eternal life. And I trust God's word more than what a man will tell me. So you can know. And if you don't know or if you're not sure, you can. You can know and it can be today. If you aren't sure, then I want you to come talk to me. We're going to pray in just, just a second and we're going to sing our final song. And if, again, if you're not sure, I want you to come talk to me. We will sit down here. We'll go back to the office. We'll sit wherever you need to. We'll look at what God's word says together. And we'll stay as long as you want. We'll stay until you know. I want you to know that 150,000 people will die today. Every 24 hours, 150,000 people step into eternity. I don't want you to leave today saying, you know what, I sure hope I make it. I sure hope I do. Because eternity, that's a long time to be wrong. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you for the assurance that you've given us in your word. Help us to trust in your word. Help us to never trust in our own heart, in our own feelings, or in anything that man might say, because, Lord, your witness is greater, as John says, than anything any man could ever tell us. And we put our faith and our trust today in your word. And, Father God, I just pray today that if there's anybody here today who says, I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know that if I stood before you today that you would say, welcome, you good and faithful servant. But I hope so. Lord, convict hearts today. Break down any barriers of shame or it doesn't matter what anybody thinks because on the day of judgment, it ain't going to matter what anybody else thinks. It only matters what God thinks. It only matters what you think, Lord. And so, Father God, be in among us today. Help us today. Bring us to our knees if need be. Don't let us wait until we hear about massacres like it, it happened last weekend that get us thinking about our eternity and our faith in you. But let our faith be tried and true and sure in you. As John says, I have written this so that you will know. So Lord God, as we leave this place today, let us know that you are a great God, that you are a God that saves and that you wish that none should perish, that all should come to repentance and faith. Oh God, we cry out to you today. Give us that assurance in our hearts. And we thank you. We love you, God. We praise you, God. And it's in your Son, the name above all names, the King of all kings, the Lord of all lords. It's in His name we pray, the name of the Lord Jesus, the name above all names. It's in His name that we pray.